you doing? Yeah, very well. Very well. Jackson Chen from ACR365. That's yes. your agency name. That is indeed. Would you consider yourself a software company now or would you say that you're still an agency? No, I've always, I'll say much, much more towards the software side, if anything. Like we don't do much on the lead generation side, very much in the software space. Yeah. So can you describe your niche? Where, which space you work in? Are you global? Are you national? Like give us the rundown. Yeah, very much. So the niche we're working with is very much in the gym gym space or the health and fitness gym owners, studio owners, PT, PT studio owners. Business-wise, yeah, global. Like we've got UK, Malaysia, Asia, North America, Australia, New Zealand. They're your main clients. That's where we have. And yeah, it's definitely in that sort of niche gym space where we're providing marketing solutions, but very much in expanding into other sort of services within that fitness space. Yeah. Okay. So if you were to, if you were to take on someone from the UK, like a customer from the UK, is there like how much work is involved? Is gyms are universal no yeah. matter where you go? There's no kind of, there's nothing that gets lost in translation. It all just applies or? Yeah. In, in terms of, I guess, our core product, yeah. we, our focus has always been like a business out of the box. Essentially, what we've done is we're taking, and then we've got three or four guys who own multi seven dollar for seven figure gyms, and then multiple times, we've taken all our experiences over the last 10, 15 years and look at a model that we believe is great for lead generation, retention, nurturing, to all the way through to client journey to ongoing membership management and ongoing marketing. We'll put that into one space inside our platform, ACR, and so here's our best recommended processes when it comes to building a seven-figure gym because we've all done it and we've all gone from zero to high seven, six figures to seven figures. These are the processes. These are the things we do to help you to create that, and I guess, point of contact in your business. And then what we did was we actually stripped it back in such a way that you only have five things you need to learn to do within the platform but you can just go focus on what's important. I think one of the things that is running gyms that you may well know is that there's so many things you need to do. And there's so many things you need to do not only on a repeated basis, but the things that what gym owners don't, don't appreciate is that if you can improve your business by five or 10% in each of those different little areas, we're not looking at huge changes, but gives you the ability to do what you need to do for your business, like marketing and sales, which is what you should be focusing on and going deliver great services and forget about all these nitty gritty things that you should be doing on repeat. That's just, it's just time, time consuming. Yeah. Like you've got to be focused on this great service, great getting to generate the leads. You shouldn't be worrying about how many emails should I be sending or how many emails am I up to for this particular client or do I have to send an onboarding email? It's, we just find that too, too many people are doing too many things manually yeah. and there's not enough collaboration between platforms. And that's yeah. what we, that's what we claim to want to, want to work towards. Yeah. Do you focus on a particular type of gym, like the higher ticket F45s versus like a fitness first, low value, high volume of members, low value of membership subscription, or is it again, universal? It's pretty universal because the client journey is the same. Whether you're a PT studio or 24 seven gym or a boutique, right. there may be some variations, but in terms of client journey, they all need to be captured somewhere. They need to be nurtured somewhere. They're all going to have a really great onboarding experience and client journey going into a studio or a gym. The better you can automate some of these processes along the way, the better it is for you to have the time being safe and more efficient you can do your business. Yeah. Yeah, because as we we actually met because we I think we both owned the same mm. franchise at the same yep. time in our past. Yep. And I remember from that experience that whilst, because I came from sales and marketing background, like mm. I would do an okay job at new client acquisition, but retention yeah. was the hardest thing. Yeah. And we'd be celebrating that we'd get net. Yeah. You know, we look at gross plus five for the mm. week, but then when you look at the net, you'd be, you would have lost seven. So you're net negative two. And you're like, when does this end? And I remember yeah. it being extremely frustrating. So it's so cool to see you helping. I wish I could have had your tech right yeah. <laughs> I was running my, it, it's so cool to see how you're helping so many because i know how much hard work goes into running a gym yeah personal experience and so to have this solution available to people i think is awesome yeah tell us about 
what's your kind of you don't have to use specific numbers but like mm. size wise where are you at now yeah where were you 12 months ago and are you a team of one or your team of 10 like what does that kind of look like yeah look 12 months ago we're probably we're probably sitting around maybe I'll say because the whole business grew organically like we right. we haven't done any ads or anything like that everything is done through organically we sort of steady growth about 5% to 10% on a monthly basis, just adding, like you said, adding two every single week. So we're sitting around 100, 190, 180 accounts at the moment. And it's, it's and in terms of the team, we've got myself and I've got four VAs that does support in the, on the back end. we are start obviously offering a few different services, but most of them are really just there to support not only myself, but the back end build outs that we need yeah but it's so streamlined at the moment if anything the team is probably bigger than what it needs to be uh, really it's because as you start to grow and you start to see the different gaps that you can you can make better yeah i know uh, and now we've got to a point like when we started implementing more automation and more integration with other platforms but the teams that i've got we can probably handle 400 accounts without any problems yeah because it just it, i remember Listening to Elon Musk when he was talking about building Tesla, the first you know, million or the first, let's say a thousand cars that you build is probably the most heavy labor intensive because you're you're trialing, you're learning. And what happens is that you get to a point in your business, you actually make your business a lot more efficient. Yeah. So the core product becomes better and your process becomes more efficient. So you grow business at the heaviest lifting is actually the first, let's say hundred clients, yeah. but then get to the hundred, 150 clients. You can actually scale to 400 probably with the same team because your teams are more efficient. Yeah. Your systems are more efficient. Like literally the way we onboard clients now, it's, it's literally a payment into a, an automation. Accounts get set up. All the snapshot gets set up and all the different things, even like things like the customized CSS all get set up automatically. They get sent automated Google drives. It's a whole bunch of process that gets automated on the back end because you just learn to do those things as you start to grow your business because you see the communication is better. So it's just the team become a lot more efficient. They can do a lot more with a lot less time. Yeah. One of the things, because because uh, as because of our relationship now, commercial relationship is that we help you with some of the support. Mm. And so we get to get, we get to have a look at like mm. your system. And I was, blown away by <laughs> the level of sophistication with your snapshots and everything yeah. <laughs> you know the user experience as well looks really good but it's such a you just can't see that it's such a good example of what's possible the snapshots that you must be applying for the different plans or whatever must do so much out of the box i remember seeing it was just like hundreds of workflows sitting there yeah. ready to go yeah and i know that it's difficult to figure that out because of the custom values and all this type of stuff but I actually had no idea that you had that many sub accounts. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So you're already like in the high level universe, like you're already one of the outliers of mm. agency owners that has reached like 150 plus 200. Yeah. And I'm guessing that is because of that ability. To, so that, that snapshot now is it's part of your intellectual property, right? Like yeah. It's, you know, yeah. The workings of how that's automated. Like 100%. Like you said, it's all to do with wasn't just the hundreds of workloads, but it's like it's hundreds of workloads that work on the back end, but it's only five clicks on the front end for them. To right. And that's what we're trying to get it to point is, okay, this happens, this is going to happen on the back end. And when you want to get to the next stage, it's just a click of the button or click on an icon to yeah. move on to the next stage. But it's not, one thing we've found over the last few years is that how can we make the user experience more friendly? Because the biggest thing, the biggest thing when it comes to high level user experience, especially my first 12 months of business is that, it's extremely complex. Yeah. To try and teach someone to how to do something, it takes weeks to get it on board. So we've learned that rather than trying to teach you how to do something, like the 10 clicks to get to a cost of value, why don't we just try and find ways we can optim optimize the onboarding process? When they complete that onboarding form, all those cost of value are done. Yeah. And then they, all they need to learn is that if this person is on a seven-day trial, just click on this button. The seven day journey begins yeah. or the 20 day button, the whole journey begins. So in our onboarding press, I teach them five things they need to know. And that's it's 90% of the thing, 90% of the studios, they can just go away and just do those five things. It's more than enough. Yeah. But there are people who want to optimize and do more things, but we usually say then after you get used to what you're doing, this can get you to a point you can get 200 clients comfortably without doing any, making any changes. And yeah. I think that's what's appealing to the people is it's, it is a business out of the box. 
And it is, it takes a lot of thinking out of their day to day because it gets a gym owner to go, okay, you're now going to optimize it, your, your whole entire process and they should learn how to do something. And plus a new tech, this is not just one new tech. This is like seven platforms in one. They're going to do yeah. it all learn at the same time. Yeah, It's a super steep learning curve. So we just try to aim to make sure that we create a system that doesn't take that long to learn. And we're trying to help them to understand you. If you do these basics and you can get your business going and growing quickly. Yeah. I think I remember seeing a lot of it driven from, and this could be wrong, but it was a lot of the driven from the opportunities board and they were dragging and dropping. So if this is here, drag and drop into this element and then a bunch of stuff happens. Yeah, it's right. two things that we will focus on is drag and drop on the opportunities yeah. and also the conversation view with custom fields. Right. They're the two main driving of, of automation. Like they either drop them into a different pipeline or they click on a custom field that automates the ongoing journey. Yeah. No, I do remember that as well. I see like you had a lot of nice, like all the questions that someone... Mm essentially ask prospective member grouped into the right mm -hmm. folders. And so you're saying like, if a value goes in one of those boxes, yep. like they want to do a seven day diet, yep. whatever, then some stuff happens and they can just forget about it. Or it's exactly. Yeah. Like that was probably one of the biggest thing we get the feedback we hear from people as gym owners, like the moment comes, someone gets on board, they're going to send an email, send an onboarding welcome email, tell them what to do next, the on the waivers, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's all automated now. So like the one click of the button will send the welcome email, will send the put it into the right groups, we'll put the send in the contract that they need to sign. They get returned back to us and then all back to the gym owners. They get signed, get notified and move on to the next stage of the workflow. But it's all coming from driven from one click of the button, which is what they love about it is that it's, it's, it's one process or one simple process. Not only is it easy to teach, but easy to replicate for the staff. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So I'm still blown away by how small your team is. And you're saying that you actually probably have too many people because <laughs> I'm pretty sure like you're almost seven figure or you already are a seven figure. Not quite there yet, but we're getting yeah. close. Getting yeah. Close. yeah. That's incredible. Okay. So like thinking about you're almost there. What is, where do you put all your time and energy into sort of like new customer acquisition? And I'm talking specifics. People watching these types of interviews, they want to know, do I go and advertise on Facebook? Do I go and advertise yep. on Google? What are you doing? And double downing on, or is that a word, doubling down on? Yeah, I, look, we have done very well organically. Um, yeah. We are doing some ads acquisition, yeah. but we find that in day, this day and age, that value proposition or value offerings are far more powerful because the thing is that we can give away a lot of the tips and tricks in what we do in the gym business. But in terms of being able to do it themselves, it becomes very difficult. So what we tend to find that in, in, if you want to grow, it depending, depends what niche you work, but I still believe that these days that it does take a little bit longer to build, but if you're able to build trust and build value in someone else's business, they're much, much more likely to buy from you. Like yep. they see ads and different things all the time. But the thing is that, they need to one have an actual problem they need to they need you to solve, and number two they need to see that you're an expert in that particular field. So you can run an ad, and they'll you probably get people coming in for whatever that may be. But the thing is, your conversion rate may say it's 20 percent. But our conversion rate, because the leads are so warm, we'll convert about 80, 90 percent most of the time because they've already seen our stuff for six months or so, or seen right. our our content. Like we've given away zaps, or we're giving away all the different kinds of things that we do, the best sort of practices when it comes to optimizing our email flow, opt best practice when it comes to using the onboarding processes, they have the blueprints, but it's like, we've got the implementation, we've got the tools that we're going to right. build out. Instead of them spending 10, 15 hours, 20 hours, or two or three weeks working it out, it's ready to go. So when they come to us, it becomes much easier. It's a much easier sales process. And one thing I would say is that scaling fast doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Yeah. <laughs> like, and it's great to scale quickly, but at the same time, I think if you're able to scale at a steady rate, your team can handle a lot better as well too. Yeah, for sure. So does that mean that you're, you're would you say that you're, if you sat, like you sat down and wanted to pick apart like your marketing strategy, is it oh, community and content? Is yeah, hundred percent. Community content. It's about what we do, what we can do, what we offer, and yeah. what the, the and with the community that we already have, right. with our coaching team and things like that. It just makes sense to to take the next step because 
you create a problem for them in the business. They've got too many leads or they got uh, they, they have a broken sales process or broken onboarding process. That's an actual problem we identify. Once you identify that, then there's an actual solution for them. Yeah. So if someone signs up in Canada tomorrow, mm-hmm. yeah. where are they likely to come from? What's the source for you? A lot of them will come through just general conversation. It may be some of the posts that we do on Facebook. Facebook they, yeah. they, they could be just like say engaging in, for example, some of our different strategies that we have when it comes to organic marketing and or, or some, of those, or some of our onboarding blueprints that we provide as a resource. So people are obviously looking for a particular need yeah. And yep. that's when we start conversation to say, okay, let's have a look at the actual, what you're actually doing to see how we can actually find a gap in how we can fix that particular problem. Yeah. Does that mean that you, would you have a spend to increase the effectiveness of what you're doing organically through content? Or do you just, it's the time, it's the value of the content itself. Like You don't put marketing dollars behind it or is it a hybrid model of those two things? It, I, we just starting to get to a point where probably starting to get a bit, some put some marketing dollars behind it because, like I said, like our team is big enough to grow it five to ten a week if we wanted to right. because the system is a lot more optimized. Yeah. But what we're doing at the moment is a team that we actually really spending a lot of time in and educating the team and teaching them how to do the back end processes. So my goal is to obviously to eliminate myself on the team as much as possible yeah. to really move into that sort of a much a much higher end type business owner as, as someone who's got a system in place that the team can then take over. So once we find a content that is, or can you say it's working, or we find that people seem to have a, a good reaction to, yeah. then that's where we'll put some dollars behind it. One thing we'll say, a lot of people think that we need to create a million different types of different resources. You don't. You actually only need about 10, 10 really good resources and you just cycle them through because once you do that, you can just continue to recycle them because new people will see it. Yeah. And as, as you continue to grow your, 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 I guess, your audience, new people will see the same content. You don't necessarily have to create 100 different YouTube videos yeah. just to grow your brand. Like You, you can yeah. have... I remember someone we were talking to recently, he has one good resource and he's been doing it for two years. He's a multi-million dollar coaching business, but he's got one resource that he just continued to cycle through yeah. because it's good enough. People will want it and there's a problem people need to listen to. So I think that the one thing I will say if people listen to this is I don't feel like you have to become this wildly well-resourced YouTuber for you to get good content out. You just need some good resources for people to listen to and to engage with. And if you can solve a particular problem, there's plenty of people that will listen to your stuff. For sure. That's such good advice because it's really interesting. I've done a little bit of YouTube and Mm. um, something that really pained me was like, there was never instructions on how to add Gmail into high level. Yeah. Yeah. Figured it out. I did a YouTube video on it and I get every week someone says, thanks. Like I couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And that's just exposure. And then they'll probably watch exactly. two or three more videos, right? Yeah, um, correct. And it was never a piece of content that I thought this is going to pay dividends, right? Yeah, yeah, it was 100%. Just a cool thing. But yeah, so in the context of high level, because what I'm seeing and another reason why I want to have these chats with successful agency owners and you're just starting out, like you mm. seven figures is probably just around the corner for you and then beyond. But the thing that you're talking about, which is growing at a manageable, reasonable pace, mm. sounds like you have that Elon Musk mind where you're just like, I can consider any rate of improvement growth at just yeah. the time. Yeah. And I think I see, because you see a few, like you see a lot of people, you know, talking about that they just brought on a hundred people in a month or whatever. Mm-hmm. Thinking the only way you could really do that is if you were a point solution rather than a solution for the entire business. In yep. that, if you went and marketed, <clears throat> here's an alternative to Mailchimp. You just spoke about the email marketing tool within mm-hmm. a while ago, and you somehow could do all the CSS and lock it down so that that was the only thing. Sure. Everyone knows how to craft an email and drag and drop elements into it and send it to a list. But your customers are those five things you talk about. Mm -hmm. You're so automated already, but still Mm -hmm. like you're talking about a business owner 
you're touching every aspect of their business, right? Yep. You can't onboard thousand customers, right? Yep. Because you actually need to give them the attention they deserve. 100%. Yeah, and yeah. I think that there's a, I think there's going to be a nice, there's a medium there. I think if you're selling high level white label, I think it, eventually you're going to sell more than just one piece of functionality in the system. Correct. It does so much that the opportunity there is to touch every aspect of someone's business, and it's just going to require time to spend. Yeah. With yeah. You're not yeah. going to be able to onboard everybody. Yeah. Through some videos. You can't. Like, look, we've tried various different ways of onboarding clients. And the one thing we know that doesn't matter what kind of business you're in, you need to have that interaction. If you're pure SaaS, you can only... What we found that if you're going to offer pure SaaS business, yeah. you need to provide one, a simplified version of high level. Yeah, You can't... I don't believe you can actually offer the high level as yeah. a platform because they'll look at it and go, oh my God, there's about 1% of the people you're on board that get those, they get the platform will probably work it out because they're techie or they know something about what they've done in the past. And number two is that those guys who you start to have on board 100 clients in a month or in a week is great. But what did you do in the last four months or two years, three years to build your audience and the trust for them to do that? Yeah. I think we need to really break it down and the people hearing this and listen to these things like, okay, overnight success is great, but it's not for everybody because some people have spent years and years of building trust. They may have a thousand people in a database that have a particular solution they're already providing before. They just switched over to a different service. Yeah. Someone starting out, what you've got to be understanding is that mindset of, if I grow 5% every month, like from today, if I've got one client today and grow 5% every single month for the next yeah three years, what would my business actually look like? Yeah. If that's all you focus on, that's a far better way of growing than thinking about you have to grow it at 10 a week or whatever that may be, because one, it's unrealistic and two, it's unsustainable because I've done it before. I actually, I don't remember what we did. It It was a complete nightmare to to onboard 12 clients a week. Yeah. It 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 literally grew it changed the way we do our business because we did 12 client accounts one week was a bit of a flash sale, flash drive. Then we didn't do anything for the next two weeks because I spent most of my time onboarding the 12 clients, teaching them and getting them on board because then it's like, what was the point of all that effort? Because it's growing quickly, but then it slowed everything down at the same time. And you've got to understand your system can only, you can only grow as fast as your system allow you to, your back end system allow you to. Yeah. And that's why we're spending a lot of time on, on teaching clients, just like teaching our team to, to be able to be cross trained. So anything that sort of breaks apart, are, all the team members can actually jump on board and, and get things done. And if you simplify your whole onboarding process, it will actually make your life a lot easier. We all have this great idea that if we onboard somebody, they're just going to learn themselves. That doesn't yeah. happen. <laughs> no, it, it, it just doesn't happen. It's the amount of time we spend on like a answering silly questions yeah it's like it's there it's like you're right in front of you you just got to go and look for it yeah but you just got to understand we are still in that sort of people relationship business so that you can create a solution but end of the day if you want to grow your agency or grow your business you need to have that time spent on the onboarding and that's probably the, that's what that's probably the i believe that it's the break that the biggest is determining factor of whether or not the client will stay with you for a long time yeah that's true. I also think it's it's I've, because of what we do, we get to talk to a lot of agency owners, which is awesome, right? And man, there's some crazy successful guys out there and girls, particularly girls actually, but life insurance, for instance, in the United States is big. And I've mm. seen someone who had, they were onboarding five, five new sub accounts a day. And so they've done something extremely awesome and they figured it out and that, and that works for them, which is awesome. But that's the thing, like if I, if, the beauty of high level is that it consolidates the point, all the different point solutions into yep. a single thing. And so I feel like <clears throat> at some point, the sum total is greater than all of the, the individual mm-hmm. parts. And you you wouldn't launch a business and start going, you wouldn't just go and compete with MailChimp and just sell. Track, right? You mm-hmm. wouldn't launch something to go and compete with. I can't remember what that, there's a social media tool that allows you to whatever that owl or whatever it's called you wouldn't do that because i feel like the end user experience of that would be what else can it do and you'd be like oh we've turned it all off why do you know what i mean and so the minute that those things have to become a business process 
there's more to talk about, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I just, I'm fascinated by, you know, this agency that I'm talking about in the life insurance, right? And I think they must be one of the biggest high level agencies in the world. But mm. <laughs> to what they do to onboard that many people on a daily basis, they still have a person doing it, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's not, they can't just sign in and just figure it out. Right? No, nah, no way. Yeah. No, no way. We just, we have to remember that any, anyone comes to any software, the biggest issue with high level is that it's just, it's such a beast of a platform that they really need someone to walk them through. And who's going to sit there for three hours looking at videos? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. they want something to teach them the basics. So it's like, yeah. what are some of the basic things I need to know right now? And that's what we found out. Like, what are some of the base, the most, the top five action app items you can do in the first month? If you can do those things, you're good to go. Yeah. And we, we found those things and said, so how can we get those things really tidy so that they feel confident? And one thing we we talk about in, in SaaS is that it's that I got it moment. And if you, if you can get it, get, if, if you can shorten that time between them signing on to I got it moment, if you can shorten that process, you're going to win in formula. Yeah. If Take some three months to do it, then you have a long buyback time for to acquire a customer to get to that point. So yeah. the shorter you get that time frame, the better it is for you to grow your business. Yeah. That's again, that's such awesome. That's a magical piece of advice there. Because like I just think back to because I do a lot of coaching with affiliates, right? Yeah. You know, they're like, what should I do? What should I do? I'm like, look, probably there's probably like three things that I would do. If you have no idea what you want to do, probably like three, maybe one, I'd plug in Apex to yep. miss call text back and the opportunity pipelines and reputation management they all sit on their own two feet but yep. they can talk to each other and i correct. think you can show someone how to use those pretty easily right yeah correct you correct. don't have to go so deep but again if it's just you as a solopreneur or whatever and you're just going to sit down at a computer work from home and try and do this you onboard five people like you're on the phone right for the next two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Talking to them about this is how you do it. Have you forgotten yeah. your password? Have you okay? Yeah. Blah, blah, yeah. Blah. And then, oh, you got this in your case. You got it. Like, <laughs> this, I think that it's, it's a, it is certainly a fallacy to think that you could click some buttons and overnight be taking on 10, 20 new client accounts every yeah. day. Yeah, um, that's right. Man, I'd love to be proven wrong by that. I see some people in the community. I'm not going to name names, but I yeah. see some people in the community where they're like, if I do this, I can do this in 30 mm. days. Yeah. Or I'll, whatever they said they were going to do, shave their head or something. But yeah. Show us, right? Because yeah. I just, when the reality of how much the customer experience when they first get into your software, I feel they just want to, speak to someone and if it's just you're the marketing salesperson customer success support you're everything right yeah that's right so you max out pretty quick right 100 percent. oh exactly and i think and the question is that that we said we alluded to early on is that how much trust have you earned how much trust how much authority do you have in your own community most of the people who are starting an agency they don't know you do you really want to sit on board 10, 10 clients overnight and the amount of support you need to do on the back end is also like something that people don't talk about it's like we, I think this is one thing I don't, I get a bit funny about social media and different posts like that. It's like, you're not telling us a full story. Yeah. It's not a full story. It's not a full picture of what you have actually done. And you got to be real about what actually can happen. There are people who are on board of thousands and thousands of on clients, but they've been working for 10 years in the industry. Yeah. Or the same industry. Yeah. So it's just over. I just believe that we just need to be real about these things is that overnight success doesn't happen for most people. And and it's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you focus on the simple stuff, focus on the simplicity of the business and really keep it simple, then you have the right mindset of growing at a 5% on a monthly basis. It's already a really great business in three years time. You know? Oh, absolutely. If you sat down, right. And if we, if we sat down and broke apart your unit economics, mm -hmm. if that was a, if it was your own intellectual property in terms of all the technology, software, infrastructure, and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. The unit economics, investors would be pouring money into your business, right? Of how healthy it is. But the beauty is that anyone looking at deploying, like everyone who's, like anyone looking at doing this with high level has this massive advantage in that you don't, you're not paying the AWS bill. You're not paying GCP money. Yeah. So the unit economics get to take shape 
and this is again this is some of the stuff that i try and drive home in some of mm. these initial calls it's like the opportunity to have infinite infrastructure at your disposal which you don't yeah. pay for yeah should change how you think about client acquisition yep. and various other bits and pieces for instance I don't know if you offer a trial period, but you should offer a trial period because who cares if they use it and send a mm. million emails and yep. this, that, and the other, like it's not, it's not your infrastructure, right? Yeah. Like high level of foot in the bill. Yeah. They've obviously got a great deal with AWS and GCP and they don't care. Mm. So why would I force someone like this is going to apply differently across the board, right? Of course. Yeah. Correct. And, generically speaking, I can say, why would I force someone to pay before they start using it when I it doesn't cost me anything to give this to someone to try mm -hmm. it out? Yeah. Literally. And so subscription revenue model business, you mm -hmm. could go if you wanted to raise money or whatever, you could take those this term sheet to someone and say, we can do a million trials a week Yeah, because we don't pay for it. Our yeah. unit economics are so healthy. We're growing at 5%. That's such a good business, right? Yeah. Correct. An amazing business. You might exactly. not own the software at the end of the day, but who cares, right? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I think that's the one thing that people don't realize how great opportunity it is to build a SaaS business within the high level community. Because, like you said, if you had to try and develop something like a high level, it's not just hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's like millions of dollars to get it to that point. Yeah. Uh, and like it's millions of dollars that you most people don't have yet. You got this opportunity to go grab all these tech that's already been developed. But now how do I position it in, a, in my particular market to make it unique? And I think that's a key here is that you want to make your product unique. So we are taken a high level in that we just, yes, we use the marketing stuff, but we've plugged all kinds of stuff into our high level to make it unique in our knit fitness space. We're not the only people using high level in the agency space, but we're the only one that can do you know, e-signing, we can do the only one who could do contracts, we're the only one who can do membership management, taking payments all under one place. But it's about how can you position that, grab this high level machine and how do you position it in the marketplace to make yourself different? Like you said, putting UPEX in there, it's such a simple plugging with high level that make it immediately different to everybody yeah. else. So just you just got to find that little bit as point of difference and just utilize what you already have and just start in making it a bit more unique so you can cut through the noise. Yeah, absolutely. How did you, how do you figure out what, like from a product innovation point of view, like how do you figure out what to put in mm. moving forward? Do you just, if you see a good third party add in or something, you just be like, oh, that'll add value. And do you just throw it in or do you productize it and go back to your customer base and say, here's a new thing. It's going to cost you more money. Yep. Do you have a strategy or anything you can talk us about that? Yeah. So we always have a core product. So that's our core range. Yeah. And then what happens is that in terms of prioritizing, in terms of adding things in there, one, it needs to have value, obviously, for the client. And number two, it's going to come down to whether the, the consumer needs it. You got to understand sometimes you can add too many things that yeah. it doesn't apply to them. So we listen to the feedback from our client base to see what some of the needs are. And then if we see an actual solution that could apply to them, then we actually add those solutions in there. And I think that's the really key thing when you're growing your business is that listen to your clients or listen to your clientele to see what's a gap. Because if you'd learn how to solve or bridge those gaps, then you would never be short of business. And I think that's what the key is. It's always looking to solve a particular problem. Yeah. You know, I think too many people we think about is we try and think what we should add in there instead of things what the client's doing. So yeah. the client is one that's going to drive your business. Yeah. What I've seen, which is really fascinating. So I've we have a ton of agencies on, on, on our roster now. And we get to get like that. We get that inside look, right? We get to see what happens at, with ACR's customers, for instance. And like we have a few clients where they've got their own Facebook communities with thousands of people in those communities. And what I think is awesome is just the advantage that we have of white labeling high level and having mm -hmm. someone like Sean and the team behind yeah. what they're doing, right? Yeah. Every week he'll come out and just be like, this and this, mm -hmm. we know you want this stuff. Here it is. And even if you didn't want it, they- Yeah, it's there. <laughs> they're like, here it is. It's awesome. Go, yeah. and do it. Go and use it. Yeah. And I see the agency owners 20 seconds later posting in their Facebook community saying- mm. We know you've been asking for it. Here it is. And it is just literally a copy and paste of Sean's video. 
Yeah. And saying, here it is, great. And so I feel like that at least half of the time, mm. you don't even have to have a product roadmap because it's high levels roadmap and you just yeah. copy paste and you seem like you're the most innovative yeah. company in the world, right? And yeah. it's all your brand equity is the only thing that matters, right? Yeah, 100%. It's, that is so true. Like I actually was to listen to Bob Cobb podcast uh, recently, one of my mentor, Dan Martell. And he himself has said that if he was to, there are a few different companies of SaaS business he will build. And if you guys don't know who Dan Martell he is, he's, he owns a company called SaaS Academy and he's built like a multi, multi-million dollar SaaS companies like multiple times and multi-million dollar businesses. He has, so he, he saw himself, it's an opportunity. And he actually mentioned high level in one of his podcasts and goes, if I was to do a SaaS business, like I could do a no code SaaS business, like a, like his friend Sean at high level and go, and I just grab that, that, you know, that platform and then develop into my own or at least do something with it. Yeah. It's going to save you years of development. And yeah. plus you can host it by a multi-million dollar company that yeah. is able to help you to develop and always continue to innovate. Like it's millions of dollars to develop a software, but yet he goes, you can actually develop a SaaS business so quickly by being able to tap onto a company that's giving you the platform. Yeah. It's I, I describe it like this. Like it's like, like everyone buys a skyline, for example, if you like cars, you buy a skyline. It's what you do with a skyline that makes a car faster. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like everyone can buy one, but it's what do you do with it now to make it a, a more unique vehicle for you? Yeah. Because I come from real classic software startup land, right? And so I've mm. always been working, I've always worked for software companies. There's always been an engineering team, a development team and all mm. that type of stuff. And the reason I'm, was, I'm always attracted to that is because of the amount of innovation that's possible, right? And I feel like 2023, like the, a platform like High Level, right? Mm. It basically, I know it's focused on sales, marketing, whatever, but you could... There's an argument that could be made was, why would you bother unless mm. you're going and solving genome sequencing or something that's got absolutely yeah. nothing to do with something? You know, why would you go and get an engineering team and build something when there is a platform that robust that requires no, you can code, yeah. build your own high level on top of that API tomorrow? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. But why would you do it? You can just change the logo, right? Like, yeah. just. The, there would be a reason there would be an argument for it but i just think it's crazy like in the no code state yeah. of tech right like it's awesome. yeah i think it just comes down to what your end goal is yeah like, what's your end goal if, if you want to have a great little SaaS business i can give yourself a couple of hundred subscribers that's already a good business like, yeah you know, two, 200 subscribers in your business that's it's like it's a half a million to six hundred thousand dollars a year SaaS subscription model you're making 80 percent in margin if you structure it correctly it's already a good business. Like it's, yeah. It comes down to what's your end goal. Like if you want to be a coder, be that person that creates something very unique, yeah, by all means, spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into development, do something unique. But what's your end goal? If your end goal is to create a lifestyle for yourself, for your family, and then no code is a no-brainer yeah. because it just makes your life so much easier. You don't have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars into a business. It's there ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Look, something personal. So I think just like your own journey, I had no idea that you played golf professionally. Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, how long yeah. did you? How long did you do that? Tell us a bit about. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a golfer for twelve years. Like, I, wow. I tw- yeah, in my twenties, that's where I started. I was a golf professional professionally, um, awesome. and I coached for tw- 10, 10, 12 years. And then that's how I got into personal training. That's when yeah. I got into the fitness and then yeah. got into gym ownership. But all through that time, I've always been a self-employed and always wanted to do yeah. to business ownership. So it just progressed from one to the next. Yeah. Would you see, would you do a golf coaching niche with high level? Would you do it? I haven't thought about it. And it's something it's come up a few times into that space. Yeah, potentially. I just, yeah, I just had to have the, I might have to dug back into the industry to have a look at what the needs are. Yeah, and um, and have a look at what's what is needed in that industry. Yeah, it's changed. It's changed a lot over the last ten years. Yeah, yeah. Because I think so. In terms of what came first, fitness came first, but then you mm. obviously being self-employed, being a business owner, you had to be resourceful and figure out ways to 
get new clients or whatever. And I guess in yeah. some point you stumbled across higher level some somewhere. But. Yeah, exactly. And there was during the times of when I was doing my, was growing my gym, it was that the yeah. need was there. I was using another higher level platform at the time. The focus was all about leads, generation and acquisition. But then as I got, I got more involved into the high level platform, realized that there's actually a lot more to it than just lead acquisition. Right. That is the one part of the business. And then yeah. we start... And, and to run a gym, like there's so many other things we can do. So we started improving what our systems were doing in our studios and we started using it in the other businesses and then creating something of our own that was able to help and solve problems. So my motto is always about how can you improve your business 5% of the time? You know, that's if we can get you more efficient with your business, then we know you can get more leads because you can get 20 leads a week today, but if your sales system is broken, it doesn't matter how good the agency is. Yeah. It's not going to solve your problem. Yeah. It's only just a, I think it's a bit of a shining thing for people to want to have because they want to get more leads, more leads, but it's great. But if you can't sell properly, you can't have a good sales acquisition system. You don't have a good converting system. You don't have a good retention system. Those leads can only sustain you for a certain period of time. Yeah. They won't sustain you for long periods of time. Yeah. I think in classic software, they the term to use to describe that sort of phenomena is like mortgaging your future. But you can go and get, if you've got a quota for your sales reps to yep. hit 20 deals, right? Whatever. Or let's say $20,000. Of course you can go and get them. You just yep. discount left and center, right? <laughs> Lifetime deal, this, that, and the other. And then in, in the quarter's time, you're wondering, you know, we, we need new leads. Our yeah. cash flow doesn't look the way it means to be. It's because all of this stuff on the front end, you just started fire sailing and this yeah. and, the other, and you're wondering why you don't have subscription revenue now. It's because exactly. you did a lifetime deal of $100 just to make yeah. it. You know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Exactly right. Exactly right. And just knowing that those numbers, I think that's what's important about these, especially in our niche. Like in our niche, it's, it's all about how can we make sure those numbers stack up. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I just wanted to I just wanted to touch on specific high level things as well. So do you is there a resource that you couldn't live without? Is there a lesson that you learned that you would if you were t- telling like a younger version of you, mm. watch out for this, like any major things like that? I think the one thing I've learned and I think it's it just I think like the one, the most important thing is be patient when yeah. it comes to growth. Yeah, like, right. I think I'd be patient with growth to know that because every stage of your growth, you're going to account, account of different problems. Like when you're a $5,000 a month agency owner versus someone who's a $20,000 a month agency owner, you're going to account different problems. So be patient with the growth, be patient with what you're doing on each stage. That when you get to that sort of 60, 80, $100,000 a month, it's a whole different level of problem you're going to be dealing with. Right. So don't feel like you have to go from today and try to get that growth quickly. Just enjoy the journey. Yeah. Like enjoy the journey along the way and learn along the way and be patient with the growth because that's what's going to really determine where you're going to be in 12 months, two years, and so on. Yeah. No, look, I can definitely have firsthand experience on growing too quickly. When I first, I mean, when I first started an agency and I had high level. I level came in, it was like, okay, this is going to allow me to scale better, mm-hmm. but certainly didn't solve the scaling problem. Like the business, no. the business was actually flawed in that. Yeah. It was services, mostly services. It was scaled to whatever it was. I think it was like 35, 40 grand a month or whatever it was. And it was like, okay, that's a ceiling. I yep. can't do anymore. There's not enough hours yep. a day. Yeah. Yep. And so whilst it's great to be looking at your monthly revenue or whatever, you're like, mm-hmm. okay, cool. That's there. And then you know what? Six months later, it was half that because. Correct. It was services based. You couldn't keep up, all that type of stuff. Yep, hundred percent. Yep, exactly right. And I think that's a really key thing for uh, the key is to firstly determine what you want the end goal to look like, and then find a roadmap to to get there. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. Look, we got about a few minutes left, and I just wanted to talk about what we do together mm-hmm. and customer success is a it's a big thing for me, right? Mm-hmm. Both as an agency owner. And now as a vendor, helping yep. high-level agencies at different stages of their journey. As I said, like you're pretty pretty far, like in, in the ends of the spectrum, you, you're over here. You've already figured it out. But even though you you probably wouldn't say that you figured it out mm. from the outside looking in, you've got it figured out. Or at least it's very dialed in. But yep. 
you still ended up deploying a customer success function through my company. Yep. Uh, what do you think the impact has been? Has it helped change your focus or increase your efficiencies? It doesn't yep. have to be a client testimonial. I just wanted to... Yeah, 100%. Like I said earlier, I allude to the fact that I'm all about being able to be more efficient in my own business or in other business businesses. So I have to apply the same principle to my own business. Like okay, customer success and also support is a huge part of any SaaS business. Now, if you look at anyone that leaves a high level or any sort of SaaS platform, you'll find that if they are disgruntled about them leaving going somewhere, is one, maybe it didn't quite fit their needs. And most likely the number two reason why they're leaving is because they didn't get the support they need. Yes, yeah. it's, it's that simple. It's like if they're not getting the support they need, on, in, on, if you're affiliate, you're selling like you know, hundreds of affiliates all the time and you're not supporting these affiliates, then I'm going to stick around. Yeah. So that we have tried various different things, like to use different methods of support. We've got our own channel for our own VA teams and doing things like that and to get support. The difficulty in running your own support team, if your team is not big enough, is that you you don't have enough resources to actually sustain the work. And two, what we found was that they're not only just going to be doing support, they, they may do to support the ticket a day. Then yeah. they go to other things. And yeah. it becomes very disjointed and very inefficient from our team's perspective for them to be one moment doing support, next moment doing something else they should be doing and then jump back into support again. So yeah. we decided that that's an area that we don't want them to touch. I want my team to be sufficient and efficient in Everything that everything else I do within the company, rather than having to support the day to day stuff, that's high level questions and things like that. So that's what we work with you. You guys got the team that's twenty four seven. It's around the clock, unless it's something that's that needs to be escalated. Then we can take over because something be more unique in our own snapshot. But ninety percent of the time, it solves a problem because which it mean which means our guys don't have to be checking the Facebook group or checking the channels, checking conversation becomes. It's about them becoming more efficient in their time as well too. Because if you've got teams running, you want their time to be most efficient. You know that if, if they have to go from jumping into a Facebook group, answering a question back to the tasks, that's losing probably 10, 15 minutes of the productive time. So you've got to think about it that way. If you're losing yeah. half an hour on your, each team member, that's potentially losing four or five hours on a daily basis that will stack up pretty quickly at the end of the, end of the week. And then it becomes something that, becomes an yeah. opportunity loss. Yeah. So we decided that you know, we'll get someone to like yourself to look after the support side. So we don't have, to have those, those conversations. And I remember you showing the stats that you had some hundred plus yeah, conversation no, yeah. regularly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's hours of our time that's taken off our plate. So our team's not, it's not managing. Yeah. No, and like we, what's interesting is about your clients, right? Is when we look at the business intelligence, it's these are gym owners, right? And so mm. five o'clock in the morning, they're there. Yeah. You know, yeah. They want to talk to someone, right? Yeah. Come correct. Do something, you need to talk to someone. I suppose I was talking to another client in a similar style interview last week. It was like, he doesn't want to, like, you talk about your core products, you build trust and all this type of stuff. Over nine months, you might have been building authority and trust and this. Yep. Then if you have to get dragged into, this button is not working. Yep. Like it's erosion of your own authority and brand equity or whatever. Like yep. even mm -hmm. though it's a tech problem. Yep. Whereas if you can divert that negativity, the technology away to a separate team. Yeah. We'll deal with it. You just keep doing your thing and get your business. Correct. I think that's the best balance. Absolutely. Like not a balance, but it's a division. You of got to you yep. purposely create. Yeah. Yeah, you got to have that division. Like as a business owner, if you want to get to that high six-figure or seven-figure business, you've got to divide yourself away from your primary focus as the entrepreneur, or as a business owner. It's got to be solely focused on bettering your product as a service and also marketing acquisition. Yeah. Like you, you shouldn't be just bogged down on, oh, how do I send an email? Or how do I do a smart list? Or, or like little things like that. Yeah. If you get, and as you scale to like 100, 150, you're going to understand, you're going to have more people asking you silly questions along the way. Yeah. <laughs> How do I connect to Facebook? Yeah. And it's like yeah. things like that. It's like, they're going to ask you. And then the problem you see right now at five clients, only going to be 10X when you got 100 clients. Yeah. So don't think that what you're going to have the same time as you have today is with 10 clients versus when you have 100 clients. Yeah. So you've got to find a way to distinguish those custom success and what you need to do as growing your business 100 man thank you so much so if anyone is watching this and you are in the fitness industry how can they go and find you and your stuff 
just jump on my Facebook, look for Jackson Chen. You'll find me somewhere. <laughs> awesome. Nice. Thanks so much, Jackson. I'll catch you soon, obviously. And awesome. Uh, Thank you.